Chapter 1 A Grave Mystery On August 16, 2005, the air temperature on the bank of the James River in Jamestown, Virginia hovered at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius. Sunlight flooded the beige-colored soil. At the bottom of a carefully excavated pit, the rounded surface of a human skull gleamed with a yellow-brown luster. The teeth shone white against the darker jawbone of the brownish soil beneath. The skeleton's leg bones stretched long and straight toward the end of the grave. In contrast, the arms were chaotically bent. The left arm lay across the body with the right flung toward the shoulder. Who was this person? There was no gravestone to offer a name, no signs of a coffin, no pieces of clothing, no buttons, nothing to identify the remains, only bones. Yet the small group of scientists who had gathered a few inches from the pit's rim were confident they were about to learn more. One of them, Douglas Oxley, positioned himself next to the grave and studied the skeleton. He looked at the skull, particularly the teeth. Then he scrutinized the ends of each leg bone and arm bone. He examined the pelvis, the part of the skeleton formed by the bones of the hip and lower backbone. It didn't take him long to reach a conclusion. He was about 15 years old when he died, and he was European, Oxley told the others. Puzzles of the Chesapeake the scientists who found the boy's grave have spent years working at several extraordinary sites in the Chesapeake Bay region. This area includes the modern states of Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. The Chesapeake is of special interest to people who study U.S. history because colonists built the first permanent English settlements in North America here more than 400 years ago. The lives and depths of these settlers have long intrigued historians and scientists. Most early colonists could not read or write. So the historical record, a term used by historians to refer to documents written by people of the past, contains little information about them. Historians have read and reread the surviving written records from the colony's earliest days. These materials contain fascinating information about the settlers and their adventures, but they don't tell the whole story. Archaeologists try to fill in the gaps in the historical record. They study buildings and man-made objects, called artifacts, created by people who lived in the past. They also study the remains people have left behind. As they find, excavate, and analyze these objects, including skeletons, archaeologists help us understand the past more fully and reclaim the histories of individuals who had been forgotten by the passage of time. The interpretation of skeletal remains is a specialized branch of science known as forensic anthropology. The word forensic refers to the use of science and technology to help provide evidence or facts in a court of law. Anthropology is the scientific study of human beings and their ancestors. A forensic anthropologist, then, is a specialist who examines skeletons for clues that will provide evidence about the life and death of the people to whom they belonged. The skills these scientists use to help solve crimes and provide evidence in court are also perfectly suited to the study of human remains of centuries past. The tales told by colonial skeletons include sickness, sadness, and brain-teasing puzzles. Doug Osley, one of the world's leading forensic anthropologists, is an expert at coaxing these stories from bones. He can determine through skeletal studies whether a person was old or young, healthy or sickly. He can usually tell if the bones belong to a male or a female. Had he or she done hard physical labor? Osley can often find out. Sometimes, the bones even tell him the exact cause of death. The grave of the teenage boy whom Osley examined was among more than 30 discovered inside James Fort in Jamestown, Virginia. The fort's history dates to early 1607 when a group of men and boys arrived from England in three ships. They and their sponsor, the Virginia Company of London, shared the same goal, to get rich. They hoped the land surrounding the Chesapeake Bay would hold great wealth, especially silver and gold. During the summer of 1607, the settlers built the fort and named their new settlement Jamestown, in honor of the English king, James I. Although the fort burned down in January 1608, by April of that year, the men had replaced it with another. They also built houses, a church, and storage buildings inside the fort's walls. More colonists journeyed on ships from England, including the first English women in 1608. The year 1619 saw the arrival of the first people from Africa, who came to Jamestown unwillingly. 
Initially, these Africans had been taken forcibly from their homeland and held captive on a Portuguese slave ship. The captain of a privateer, a privately owned ship that captures another ship and claims its cargo, took 50 to 60 of the Africans from the slave ship. About 20 of these people were taken to Jamestown. The historical record is unclear as to whether they lived out their lives as slaves or became free persons. Together, the people of Jamestown built more homes and government buildings, grew crops, operated businesses, raised families, and buried their dead. In their quest for land and riches, the settlers spread out into other areas of the Virginia colony and built plantations. In the 17th century, the word plantation meant farm. Jamestown quickly outgrew the area of James Fort. The materials used in the fort's construction were removed and used for other building projects. By the time the historical record reaches the 1630s, all mention of James Fort is gone. Finding the Fort For many years, the crumbling brick tower of a 17th century church stood as the only readily visible remains of the Jamestown settlement. During the late 1890s, a group of women founded an organization, the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, to protect the church ruins. Although the organization's members weren't trained archaeologists, they conducted some investigatory digs in the area. In the 1940s and 1950s, the National Park Service began formal archaeological excavations on the foundations of other buildings at Jamestown and located a cemetery. Over the following decades, many more foundations and thousands of artifacts were uncovered, but no one found the remains of James Fort. Those early scientists may not have found the fort simply because they didn't expect to and therefore weren't looking for it. Until the 1990s, almost every historian and archaeologist who studied Jamestown believed the fort's location had been at the eastern edge of the settlement, on an area of land that had been washed away by the James River many years ago. That would mean no traces of the fort would ever be found. The Jamestown Rediscovery Project proved that theory wrong in 1994. William Kelso, the project's chief archaeologist, had his own ideas about the location of James Fort. The members of the Rediscovery Project team studied historical documents and listened to oral traditions, stories that people passed down verbally from one generation to the next. The Jamestown oral traditions indicated that the fort had been near the brick church tower. Careful examination of the land near the tower convinced Kelso that the remains of James Fort had not been lost. They were merely hidden, buried beneath layers of soil in an area about a half mile kilometers) west of the Jamestown excavations conducted by the Park Service during the 1940s and 1950s. The rediscovery of James Fort was so complex that whole books have been written about it. In fact, any properly executed dig is far more than just a matter of grabbing a shovel and scooping up soil. For example, archaeologists must be mindful of the changes their work creates. Excavation removes soil and other evidence of the past that can never be replaced exactly as it was. Yet new discoveries often prompt scientists to rethink their conclusions about past excavation, so they need to be able to review the site as it was before the digging took place. For this reason, archaeologists make precise records, photos, diagrams, and maps during each step of the excavation process. The James Fort dig began with an instrument called a transit to measure and establish a grid of 10 foot 3 meter squares. This grid enables the team to precisely identify the areas they excavated and to map the location of every discovery. Next, the archaeologists carefully remove soil from specific squares in measured levels looking for artifacts. They also watch for changes in the soil's color or texture, which could indicate the presence of features, evidence of past occupations such as fireplaces or wells. The team found all these things and more. Between 1994 and 1996, they uncovered tens of thousands of 17th century artifacts including pottery, beads, coins, bottles, tools, armor, parts of weapons, and other military objects. Many were dated to periods before 1610, indicating that they were used during Jamestown's earliest days. The excavation also revealed features such as floors, brick fireplaces, trash pits, and wells. These finds, particularly the military objects, seemed to support the idea that the archaeologists had rediscovered James Fort, but they still needed conclusive proof. Ultimately, it was not the artifacts, but soil features that provided the proof. The topsoil, or surface layer, at Jamestown 
is a rich dark brown material. The layer beneath, called the subsoil, is a dense beige orange clay. Every time the colonists built a structure or dug a grave, their tools penetrated the subsoil. Even centuries later, signs of their work and the soil disturbances their digging caused remain as features called soil stains. Soil stains are areas colored differently than the soil surrounding them. Through careful digging, the archaeologists exposed lines of circular stains in the soil where William Kelso suspected James Fort lay hidden. The circular stains were the only remaining traces of wood logs that had been placed side by side, upright into the ground to form walls. This type of structure, called a palisade wall, was often built around a fort to provide defense. Moreover, the lines of soil stains joined together in a triangular shape that matched the historical descriptions of the fort's walls. Here was the confirmation that the archaeologists had sought. The shape and pattern of the soil stains could have been made only by the palisade walls of James Fort. Within the fort's walls, Kelso's team also found artifacts and soil features, as they expected. They also found graves, more than 30 of them. In a sense, that discovery wasn't a surprise. According to the historical record, almost 40% of the settlers who came to the Chesapeake during the 1600s died within weeks or months of their arrival. Illness killed some, while others succumbed to starvation. The area's Native Americans fought to defend the land from the English newcomers, resulting in other deaths. An unmarked cemetery that lay beneath the ruins of 17th century buildings about 700 feet 213 meters outside of the fort confirmed the high mortality rate. During the 1950s, archaeologists had located the outlines of 70 graves in the burial ground and excavated several of them. These remains, plus graves that were subsequently excavated by Rediscovery Project team members, revealed the burials of 83 individuals. Although Kelso and Osley believed that this outer cemetery was used until the 1630s, artifacts found in some of the graves indicate that people were buried there during the earliest years of the fort. Many of these individuals were buried quickly, as if the colonists had been in a rush. This evidence suggests that these burials contain the remains of colonists that died during the winter of 1609 to 1610. The historical record reveals that so many colonists perished from disease and lack of food during this period that it became known as the starving time. In fact, Kelso estimates that more than 150 of Jamestown's 215 colonists lost their lives that winter. The deaths occurred so frequently that at times the survivors buried two or even three bodies in the same grave. Why did Jamestown colonists have two cemeteries, one inside the fort and one outside? There are several possible answers to this question. The historical record mentions that violent conflicts with Indians occurred during the summer of 1607. At times, the fort was under siege, and it wasn't safe for the settlers to leave the fort to bury the dead. The colonists also didn't want the Native Americans to know how many men had died. They may have felt that revealing this weakening of their numbers would make their enemies bolder. On the other hand, if the Indians believed that the settlers still had a strong force, perhaps they would be less likely to attack. The archaeologists are also considering a different theory. Most of the graves inside the fort are grouped near the southwestern end of the fort, around an open area that contains no graves. Archaeologist Carter C. Hudgens thinks the team has figured out why. The graves may be clustered around a church, he explained. Cemeteries are commonly located alongside churches, and the historical record does mention that a church was built inside the fort. As long as burial space was still available inside the fort, the colonists may have preferred to bury the dead alongside the church. We still need to find the remains of the church to support this theory, Hutchins added. Since the graves are often found in unexpected places, how do you archaeologists first know that they may have located one? Especially if it is unmarked and covered with soil that no one has dug up for centuries. Once again, the most important clues are often in the soil itself. Under the soil While it's easy to locate graves in a cemetery with headstones, unless a person has been trained in archaeology, an unmarked grave may not be immediately obvious. Most burials are first noticed as stains on the surface of the subsoil. When people bury a body, they dig a pit called a grave shaft. After placing the body in the grave, they backfill, fill in, the shaft with the soil that has been removed. Because the backfill soil contains the mixed soil of the excavated layers, it is a different color than the soil that forms the walls of the grave shaft. 
The result is a stain that remains even centuries later. When archaeologists uncover a soil stain that approaches 6 feet 2 meters long by 2 feet 0.6 meters wide, about the length and width of an adult human body or its coffin, they become fairly confident they found a grave. Such a stain was the first sign of the grave that contained a teenage boy whose bones were later examined by Doug Osley. As the archaeologists scraped the subsoil surface, the trowels exposed a dark area. They scraped the soil further until they had exposed the complete stain. It was sized and shaped perfectly for a human grave. At this point, the team shifted to a standard procedure for grave excavations. First, we take a photo of the stain and the grave shaft, explained William Kelso. The photograph serves as a permanent record of the appearance of the stain prior to excavation. Next, soil is removed and placed in buckets. As each bucket is taken out of the grave shaft, its contents are sifted through a mesh screen with holes measuring 0.25 inches, 6.4 millimeters, on each side. As Kelso noted, we screen every bit of grave shaft soil to ensure that not even the tiniest artifact is overlooked. Some artifacts, buttons and coins for example, can be dated, which helps to establish a time frame for the burial. In the Chesapeake area, most 17th century colonial skeletons are buried at a depth of 2.5 to 4 feet. 0.8 to 1.2 meters. We never know exactly how deeply buried the individual is going to be, explained Hudgens, so we have to use caution. As the archaeologist reaches the depth where remains are first likely to be encountered, the pace of work slows. The archaeologists keep their eyes peeled for all signs of burial, not just bones. They look for surviving remnants of coffins, such as bits of wood or nails. Such objects may provide useful information when they are analyzed in the laboratory. In the case of the teenage boy's grave, however, the archaeologists found no evidence of a coffin. As the excavation of the shaft progressed, the team's anticipation grew. No matter how high the level of excitement may be at an archaeological dig, nothing can be permitted to disrupt the meticulous use of scientific methods and procedures. Proper excavation requires that every feature and found object be given a unique identifying number. The grave Hudgens was excavating was designated JR1225, the initials stand for Jamestown Rediscovery, while the number represents the complete grave as a specific feature. Unique features and objects found within the grave will be assigned a letter in order of discovery. The first of these, the soil that filled the grave shaft, was JR1225A. Hudgens dug further until a flash of tan caught his eye. As he wiped away the soil, he saw bone. The Jamestown Rediscovery Project was about to meet JR1225B.